being attacked from all sides. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Tiago. For those of you that don't know me, I'm hiding behind this music stand that I'm trying to raise. It's not just a disembodied voice. My name is Tiago. I'm the worship pastor and youth pastor here at Christ First. I have a quick question for you. How is my intern doing leading worship? Right? You guys, I've taught her everything she knows. Just so we're clear. Just so we're clear. Good job, you guys. Good job. Um, well, James isn't here. James is off and, and having a good time. He's over on the East Coast at a, at a pastor's conference, a leadership conference, hopefully uh, learning more and, and, and uh, continuing to grow himself so that he can come back here and lead us uh, some more and lead us some, uh, a little bit better. But here I am this morning praying that we're going to hear a, a word from God, from the Holy Spirit this morning. So I hope you are excited uh, for that as I am. About a month ago, I preached on Nehemiah. Uh, how many of you did your homework and read the story of Nehemiah on your own? A few. You see, kids, you don't have to do your homework. Right? No? Just kidding, kids. Do your homework. Sorry, Michelle. Michelle's looking at me like, what are you doing? My daughter's sitting right here. Anyway, all right. Um, if you remember... Last week, uh, we suggested to everyone that they consider today to be an hour and a half long service uh, so that we can have the opportunity to head over to the Gospel of Exhibit over uh, in the Fellowship Hall this morning. It's the reason why we're over here and not over there, as Olga mentioned. Um, and you guys, has anybody, did anybody go peek? Yeah, a few people. It's, I mean... It's amazing. It's amazing. I got out of the first service, and I just wanted to go over there and, again, just, just peek real quick, and I walked through it in, like, 20 seconds, which isn't what you're supposed to do, but, you know, just a sneak peek. And, I mean, I'm so excited to just go over there after the service and spend a good 30, 40 minutes reading through all that, looking at all that. I think that as we set ourselves up, um, as we get ready for Palm Sunday next, uh, next Sunday, and then the Good Friday services after that, um, and then Easter in two weeks, all of this just prepares us to have that that appreciation for the things that Jesus did, for what he went through for us in order so that we could be saved. So I really encourage you, when we're done here, head over there. I'm actually going to do you a favor, and I'm going to keep today's sermon short and sweet to make sure that you've got time to head over there, so you're welcome. Um, today's chapter uh, in the story is titled, Jesus, Son of God. So we'll be talking a lot about Jesus, which is always a good thing to do on Sunday morning. Um, this chapter is full of occasions where Jesus is proving himself to be God, and yet the disciples and the Pharisees and the common people, they go back and forth on whether or not um, they believe him to be God. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, four different occasions, almost like four smaller stories within the chapter where Jesus proves himself to be the Son of God, and we'll see the different reactions from the different groups of people. So before we get into it, let's just bow our heads Let's humble our hearts. Let's ask God to be here. God, as we just sang in that song, Holy Spirit, Lord, we pray that you are here this morning and not just dwelling in this room, God, but that you're penetrating hearts and minds, God. We pray that you would give us all hearts to hear what you have to say, God, that you would open our ears to hear what you have to say, that we would all leave here a little bit changed, a little bit encouraged, God, to love you more and to seek you more, God. We thank you, Jesus, in Jesus' name. Amen. So we'll be getting through our first two stories rather quickly as they'll serve more as like an introduction, giving a foundation for the later two stories that we'll go into. So we'll get through, through those real quick. So here we go. Story number one. Uh, the chapter opens up uh, with a very straightforward conversation between Jesus and his disciples. We're going to read a little portion of it in Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. It's up on the screen. There it is. Yeah. Um, and just to give you a heads up, we're going to be going through a lot of scripture this morning. If you want to follow along on your Bible or on your Bible app and your phone, go for it. But we're going to be going through it real quick. So if it helps, right up there. All right. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So the disciples answered Jesus' question with the common view that Jesus was one of the great prophets who had come back to life. The belief likely came from Deuteronomy where God said he would raise up a prophet from among the people. Why John the Baptist? Why Elijah? Why Jeremiah? 
Well, for one, King Herod actually believed that Jesus was John the Baptist come, li- come to life. So uh, the, the, the rumor of that is probably where it came from, from, uh, from Herod himself. Um, Elijah and Jeremiah were both great prophets who uh, most people at that time believed that he, uh, they were immortal. Um, Elijah, if you remember, didn't die. He was taken up into heaven. While Jeremiah's death was never mentioned in Scripture, in the Old Testament, which made a lot of people believe that he never died. Interesting, right? Uh, Let's keep reading. Matthew chapter 16, uh, verse 15 says, He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So to be clear here, Um, When Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? He wasn't specifically asking Peter. It was a plural you that Peter, as usual, being the outspoken one, the one to always run his mouth, right? He speaks up and he answers for the whole group. So the disciples make it very clear that they believe Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Son of God. And then about a week passes, and Jesus chooses three of his disciples to take with him on a little adventure. We'll read about it real quick. Matthew chapter 17, starting at verse 1. Six days later, Jesus took Peter with him, uh, sorry, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun and his clothes became dazzling white. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. So um, Jesus takes his inner circle, his BFFs, if you will, and um, which, best friends forever, kind of has a different meaning with Jesus, right? Sorry, I just thought of that. Anyway, so, um, so he, he takes his inner circle, and he goes up onto a mountain and comple- is completely transformed or transfigured. Uh, my resources, which uh, make me seem a lot smarter than I actually am, say that the word transfigured comes from the Greek word metamorphothi, which is where we get our word metamorphosis from. It refers to an outward change that comes from within. In other words, Jesus' change wasn't just his outward appearance, as many believe, but it was a true transformation from the inside out into a whole new form. What Peter, James, and John are witnessing is Jesus as his true self, who he was before he came to the earth, and who he is right now seated at the right hand of God the Father. So they see Jesus in this form, and and, uh, he's having a conversation with Moses and Elijah. So again, why Moses? Why Elijah? Why these two prophets? One reason is to prove that he, Jesus, was not them. He's much, much more than them. Remember earlier on, uh, Jesus asked the disciples uh, who the people say that he is, and they responded by saying that the people believed him to be and prophets of old. They named uh, some prophets. But here Jesus completely squashes that theory by showing himself in this radiant and dazzling form compared to the other two more normal-looking prophets. And if that's not enough for the three disciples, Matthew chapter 17, verse 5 says, He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. I think it's pretty safe to say from all of this that James, Peter, and John get the point. Jesus is the Son of God. So Jesus is now re-transfigured back into the Jesus that they know and recognize, and they come down the mountain to meet with the rest of the disciples, which brings us straight into story number two for today. Jesus and his uh, disciples, they travel through Galilee. They're in secret. At this point, Jesus doesn't want the people to know uh, where he is while he's teaching the disciples. Um, The common people— Meanwhile, they're uh, buzzing with opinions and, uh, about Jesus and who Jesus is, um, but there's no real clear consensus among the people. They're kind of discussing and trying to figure it out, while the Jewish leaders who were around uh, were already watching for the right time to arrest Jesus. So there was just as much excitement about him uh, from the people as there was concern from the Jewish leaders at this point. Let's read Ch- uh, John chapter 7, verse 12. It says, Among the crowds... There was widespread whispering about him. Some said he is a good man. Others replied, no, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the Jews. And the Jews 
in this case, as we read, refers to the Jewish leaders uh, specifically. They couldn't quite do anything to Jesus yet, uh, but they had a lot of power over the common people, and they threatened anyone who might publicly support Jesus. Later in the book of John, it says, so there was a division among the people over him. All of this uh, conversation, all that was going on, created a sort of power stalemate between the religious leaders and the common people. Let's see where this is going. Moving on to John chapter 7, verse 14. Not until halfway through the festival did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews there were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without having been taught? And again, the Jews in this case being the Jewish leaders, they're not amazed at Jesus' ability to read and write or how educated he seems to be, but they're amazed by the way he can interpret the scriptures without being trained as a rabbi. In other words, Jesus had no official human certification. He spoke with authority without having to rely on license or degree to legitimize his teaching. He didn't dress like a rabbi, but he applied the scriptures as no rabbi they had ever heard before. In the book of Matthew, it says he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as one of their scribes. Often when uh, rabbis would teach, they would quote other well-known rabbis in order to give their words more authority. But Jesus didn't have to do this because he was the ultimate authority. Again, proving his own authority as the son of God. Or the way that John puts it in John chapter 114, that Jesus was the word made flesh. After and even during Jesus' teaching, the crowd, um, along with the Jewish leaders, continued to argue and question Jesus to try and figure out who exactly this incredible prophet, this incredible teacher is. Uh, In fact, in verse 40, they say, surely this man is the prophet, referring to the prophet that was predicted by Moses in Deuteronomy. And in verse 41, right after that, it reads, others said he is the Messiah. So there's still conversation and controversy going on. But for the next several chapters in the book of John, we continue reading and seeing Jesus and the Jewish leaders disputing who Jesus is. He goes on to perform more miracles, showing his authority and showing his goodness to everyone around him. And some believe and some do not. And soon after that, we arrive at story number three. The well-known story of Jesus bringing his friend Lazarus back from the dead. Uh, Quick personal story. When I was a kid, my church always had a uh, Halloween party every year uh, for the kids. Uh, We would always have a costume party, but the catch was you had to dress like someone from the Bible. Um, As you can imagine, there weren't that many options. Um, I remember there was always a ton of angels. You know, that was easy to find at the, at the costume stores. But my mom was super, super creative. Um, I remember one year in particular, she got my brother and me um, a prisoner costume and a mummy costume. Um, <laughs> I wore the prisoner costume, okay? I was Paul in jail, okay? And of course, my brother uh, got to wear the much cooler mummy costume. He was Lazarus being risen from the dead. So when it was time for, for my brother to show off his costume, my, my, uh, my mom actually yelled, Lazarus, come out! And he came out of the back room all. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. Um, oh man, I was so excited about telling my story that I'm lost now. It's cool, I'm here. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> Jesus and his disciples, they're, they're in the town of Bethany across from the Jordan River uh, when they receive news uh, of Lazarus's illness. And at this point, Jesus has already raised multiple others from the dead, but this was a very different um, experience uh, for a few reasons. First of all, Jesus had a very real uh, and meaningful relationship with Lazarus and his sisters Mary and Martha. Uh, this is a family that Jesus had visited a lot during his ministry. Um, as we'll read in a second, John tells us that this was the same Mary who poured perfume on Jesus's feet and wiped them with her hair. These were people that Jesus enjoyed being around, people whom he loved and he loved to visit. In short, they were his friends, and his friend was dying. Let's read in John chapter 11, verse 1. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and his sister Martha. This Mary, who was uh, brother Lazarus, was sick. Uh, now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. 
When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days, and then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. Lazarus was Jesus' friend whom he loved, and Lazarus was sick and dying. So why then would Jesus hear the news of his friend's illness and not come running right away to save him? Instead, Jesus receives the message about Lazarus and decides to wait two days before traveling across the Jordan to see his friend. And I think the answer is very simple. Jesus is teaching us to wait for God's timing no matter what. No matter what. I think it's possible that uh, even if he had left right away, Jesus wouldn't have arrived on time to save Lazarus. But it's also possible that Jesus would have arrived on time, healed his friend, and missed out on glorifying the Father through this extremely miraculous and very significant act. Isn't it possible that uh, when we get too impatient to wait for God's timing, that we're keeping ourselves from glorifying God in a much greater way? And if we're honest, it's usually uh, sort of petty things, you know, that we're praying about, that we're getting impatient about. And yet here's Jesus patiently waiting, even though in his case, it's literally a matter of the life and death of a close friend. So Jesus and his disciples eventually travel to Bethany. Let's read John chapter 11, verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise in the right resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever be- uh, lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. It's uh, really interesting to see uh, these two personalities in Martha and uh, in Mary staying so consistent from what we've known about them. If you know the story of uh, Jesus visiting Martha and Mary in their home, you remember Martha uh, being the active one who was busily uh, preparing and running around the house, preparing a meal for Jesus when he came to visit. And it was Mary who sat at Jesus' feet calmly to listen. So naturally, Martha would come running to Jesus while Mary would remain at home in mourning for her brother. When Martha sees Jesus, she says to him, if you would have been there, my brother wouldn't have died. I think that a lot of people see this as Martha complaining to Jesus, but I see it as a confession of her unwavering faith. That even though she didn't seem to get what she wanted when she wanted it, and despite her terrible pain and sorrow, she still confessed her faith in Jesus by saying, I know you could have saved him. I think Martha here is teaching us that we shouldn't quickly assume that God has let us down when we're in the midst of our difficulties and our troubles. And then, of course, uh, we see Martha acknowledge at the end there, that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. Finally, Mary comes to see Jesus in verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping, there it is. When Jesus saw her weeping and then the Jews, uh, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And then comes one of the most well-known and one of the most memorized verses of the Bible, Jesus wept. There are several views on why Jesus wept. Some say that Jesus wept out of anger over those present who remained in unbelief in the face of death. Others believe that Jesus wept in sorrow for having to call Lazarus back from eternity into a world where he would eventually die again. Personally, I believe that it's because of what we read in verse 33 where it says he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. 
if you attend the service uh, regularly, then you know this about me. I'm a crier, right? I, I cry. I don't know why. I've just always been easily moved and, uh, you know, by certain things. And I'm extremely empathetic. I'm not just empathetic. I am empathetic, like, to the extreme. Um, I really am. I get picked on a lot for crying, but, you know, I always respond with, yeah, well, Jesus wept, so, you know. Um, I always called my extreme empathy a curse. Uh, when something tragic would happen to someone, especially someone that I cared about and loved very much, I would always feel it move me extremely deeply, more so than I felt like it would for other people. Um, I've actually had to learn to manage those feelings in order to keep myself from falling into a deep depression at times. And through the years, I've actually discovered that what I thought was a curse was actually a gift from the Holy Spirit. Um, I think that it's one of my greatest strengths as a worship leader and as a youth pastor. Um, It's what causes me to care so much for the people that I serve and for people in general. So it's easy for me to imagine Jesus feeling that way. I think the amount of grief and sorrow for his friend that not only he had, but all of those people that had come to grieve and mourn, I just think that that atmosphere, the tangible sorrow was too much for Jesus, that it overwhelmed him to the point of not just being sad and not just crying, but of weeping. And I personally find it to be one of the most emotional and beautiful parts of the Bible in those two little simple words, Jesus wept. John chapter 11, verse 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead men. uh, uh, The sister of the dead (laughs) men. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man. Did I do that right this time? (laughs) By this time, there was a bad odor. Uh, for he has been there for four days. And let me tell you, as a youth pastor who deals with 12-year-old boys, I know something about bad odor. Are there any? We're good. Um, Maya, Carissa, you don't, you're not paying attention. It's fine. Um, now I got to find my spot. Where was I, guys? Somebody yell. What were the next few words? That I have no idea what. Uh, uh, then Jesus said, I heard someone. Then Jesus said, Was that you, Mandy? That was a weird voice. Um, then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. The miracle that we see here isn't only Jesus uh, uh, resurrecting Lazarus, but after four days of being in this tomb, his body would have been seriously decayed. Not only was his body raised but it was restored, showing us that God doesn't just bring the dead back to life, but he restores us. Notice too that Jesus doesn't remove the wrappings himself, but he commands others to do it. Often we imagine that the gift of forgiveness and the indwelling spirit that we receive create instant, perfect Christians. But the truth is we enter Christ's kingdom with many of our old wrappings still around us, old habits and sinful behaviors, painful memories. All of these require gentle and loving removal. Like Lazarus' grave clothes, we no longer need them. But what we need is fellow Christians and Christ's power to unwrap us. John chapter 11, verse 45. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them that G- what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing? They asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come uh, take away both our temple and our nation. 
Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. I want you to pay attention really closely to what he says next. It's really interesting. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. So you see the high priest Caiaphas unknowingly prophesies that Jesus would have to die to save the nation. His intent, Caiaphas' intent, is sinful. But yet God used them to indicate that Jesus would die for the people as a substitutionary sacrifice. And this is the irony of Caiaphas' statement that John didn't want his readers to miss. Jesus' death, as Caiaphas intended, would spare the nation of Israel from physical destruction. Whereas Jesus' death um, was actually planned by God to spare Israel from spiritual destruction. Jesus' death would bring about the gathering together of all of God's children, both Jews and Gentiles, whoever had come to believe in Jesus as the Messiah. And as the Jewish leaders plot to kill Jesus, and Jesus and his disciples make their way to Jerusalem, we come into our fourth and final story for this morning. So stay with me, I promise it's all coming together real soon. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since my youth. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. In this depiction, Mark doesn't give us much of a description of this man, but in the book of Matthew, Matthew refers to him as being young, and Luke refers to him as being a ruler. It's very well known as the story of the rich young ruler. So this rich young man, who is of prominent social standing, um, comes to Jesus and falls on his knees. And considering his position and who he is, his falling on his knees before Jesus actually shows that he has a great respect for Jesus. He proceeds to call him good teacher. And Jesus' response uh, kind of seems like he's distancing himself from God by implying that only God is good and not himself. But Jesus was actually uniting himself with God by recognizing that to be called God is, uh, uh, to be called good is to be called God. He didn't immediately answer the man's questions, but instead challenged him to think about God. He was also trying to show him that goodness is not measured by works. In fact, he said, no one is good but God alone. Jesus wanted the man to turn his attention away from himself and think about God's absolute goodness. In recognizing this, the young man would have realized that there was nothing he could do to inherit eternal life. He would have received his answer. Jesus goes on to give him an answer um, a little more directly by telling him he needs to follow the commandments. But what's interesting here, if you notice, he doesn't recite all 10 of the commandments. He only recites the commandments that have to do with people's relationships with each other and leaves out the commandments about relationship with God. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother all have to do with personal relationship with other human beings and not with relationship with God. The man says that he's kept the commandments from his youth. I think that we're inclined to believe him in order to keep the continuity of the story going, but in studying this passage and seeing that he said he kept the commandments from his youth made me question the truth of his response. Him saying that he kept the commandments since his youth in his culture meant that he kept them since age 12, 
uh, which is when a boy would enter manhood and become responsible to keep the commandments in his culture. And as youth pastor of this church, I know several 12-year-olds, um, and I find it hard to believe that a 12-year-old would keep those commandments, but that's besides the point. Um, I wouldn't go as far as saying that the young man was lying. Uh, he likely very much believed that he had kept all of the commandments, but it's clear later on that he very much did not. The young man asks Jesus what he needs to do. Jesus tells him what he needs to do, and the man does not listen. He does not obey. Jesus, is challen- Jesus challenges the one barrier in this man's life that could keep him out of the kingdom, his love for money. Money represented his pride of accomplishment, his self-effort. And ironically, his attitude towards money kept him from keeping the very first commandment, which Jesus didn't mention on his list. You shall have no other gods before me. The young man didn't love God with his whole heart. In reality, the man's wealth was his God, his idol. The, the task that Jesus set him of selling all of his possessions would not in itself give the man eternal life, but such radical obedience would be the first step in showing his love of God over money. In this story, we see clearly the essence of the gospel itself. Repent and believe. Jesus told the rich young man to turn his back on his past and begin following him. And the young man may have wanted to believe, but he was unwilling to repent. He came, to Jesus, he came to Jesus wondering what he could do, and he left seeing what he was unable to do. Throughout these stories, we see Jesus proving his authority and his goodness over and over again. We see those who believe and those who do not. I think it's safe to say um, that most of the people in this room, I would say maybe even 95% of us here, believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We're here today because we're seeking to hear from God just as James, Peter, and John did on that mountaintop when the voice of the Father called out, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We've all had times where people like the Pharisees have argued with us trying to prove that Jesus is not God, but we've all experienced times where God has proven himself to us in the way that he did when he raised Lazarus from the dead. But like the rich young ruler, the issue isn't whether or not we believe in God or whether or not we hear from him, but whether or not we listen and obey when we do hear God's voice. As we close here this morning for just a moment, I would like for you to imagine, if it helps to close your eyes, close your eyes, that's fine. If not, But I'd like for you to imagine what it would be like if you listened and obeyed the voice of God 100% of the time. 100% of the time, not just sometimes, not just when you try. But just imagine reaching that impossible feat of obeying the voice of God in your life 100% of the time. Imagine the impact that would have on your family, on your personal life. Imagine if your whole family did that. What would that be like? Imagine if all the people and all of the families in our church always followed God's plan for their lives. Imagine what a Sunday morning would look like full of people who served God with all of their hearts with nothing getting in the way of that. Imagine what worship would be like coming from a sanctuary full of people who devoted everything to Christ. Imagine if every person in this room's character truly reflected their faith, the way that we spoke, the way that we acted, the way that we treated others, the way that we worshiped, the way that we served, the way that we would give. Imagine the missionaries that we could support, the programs that we could have for our youth, the homeless folks that we could feed and clothe if every person here was able to break that stronghold that money had on their lives like the rich young ruler had and gave to the church in the way that Jesus asked us to. Imagine the impact that we would have as a church on our community. Imagine what the world would be like today if every church blessed their community the way that ours could. 
All of this starts with each one of us giving our whole hearts to Jesus, the Son of God, and obeying the Father when he says, this is my beloved Son with who I am well pleased. Listen to him. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this place, Lord. Thank you so much that you have given all of us here the opportunity to come and sing and praise you and hear your word, God. Thank you that you've given us all permission to be flawed and fail because of your grace and how good it is. God, we thank you that we could come to this place and recognize fully that your son that you sent to die on a Christ for us was Jesus, the Christ, Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus, the Son of God. And I pray this morning that every person, every person in this room, from those with the faith of a mustard seed, or even those with no faith, God, those with faith that has grown tons throughout the years, throughout the decades that they've learned from you, listened to your word, God, prayed to you, God, and established this relationship with God, with you, God. I pray that each one of us would be convicted in our hearts in such a way that we would leave this place a little bit closer to having our lives be the way that you want it to be. God, I pray that today would spark a revival in our church. God, I pray that today would be a turning point in the life of this community as Christ First Baptist Church of Covina all makes a pledge and promise to follow you more in everything that we do, God. And as that happens, we build up this incredible culture, this incredible atmosphere to truly become a place that feels like heaven on earth that we'd be able to bless those around us in ways that we can never imagine because of our limited selves God but in a way that we would be able to bless in incredible ways because of your limitlessness Father God, as we close this service out, singing to you and praising you, God, and singing about your son, the Messiah, that we would be able to worship in spirit and truth, knowing who it is that we are praising, knowing who it is that we are blessing, and knowing who it is that we are singing to. And God, as we walk out of this place and go across the patio into that exhibit, God, to see and appreciate what your son did, God, the sacrifice that you made in allowing and sending and volunteering your son to come down to this earth and suffer in the way that he did, God. I pray that we walk over there and that we're moved by that, God, and that we realize that this life that we so often take for granted, this life that we choose for ourselves, this life that we act like is our own, that our mindset would change, our hearts would change, God. And that we would see that this life does not belong to us, but it belongs to you. And that in every action, every word, we recognize and remember that, God. That we hear your voice in our hearts and in our lives. And that we obey, God that we do what it is that you, God, the Father, the architect, would have us do. We praise you and worship you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God.